A very good evening to all the history enthusiasts. Uh, we are extremely ecstatic to welcome you all once again uh, to our uh, uh, much-awaited Itihasa Saptaha 2.0. Uh, on 13th of May, that is uh, uh, this month on 13th, we will be celebrating the second anniversary of our uh, page and our YouTube channel. And uh, we are so happy to have completed this beautiful journey of two years along with your support and love. And uh, we are really, really um, uh, excited about uh, the journey that awaits us in the future. So uh, it has been a wonderful two years with my friend and co-host, Ms. Nidhi Katti. Uh, so we welcome you all. Uh, first of all, I would like to welcome uh, the uh, inaugural speaker of Itihasa Saptaha 2.0, uh, Dr. T.S. Ravi Shankar, sir, a renowned epigraphist and a retired uh, director epigraphy of ASI Mysuru. Uh, we welcome you on behalf of myself, Nidhi, and all the audience members. Uh, welcome. I also welcome uh, Professor Mahesh Thakkar, sir. He is a uh, professor and uh, uh, chairperson of the Department of uh, uh, Earth and Environmental Science, KSKV Kutch University, uh, Bhuj, uh, Gujarat. Sir, welcome you on behalf of all of us. Uh, we are really happy to have you on uh, uh, our uh, virtual platform. I also welcome uh, all the audience members who have been waiting patiently and uh, also who have supported us throughout the two years and will continue to do so. Uh, welcome the audience members. And uh, last but not the least, I welcome my wonderful friend, uh, co-founder of History Enthusiasts and uh, the co-host of this entire Itihasa Saptaha, uh, Ms. Nidhi Katti. Uh, she has been a really wonderful companion and uh, our friendship will continue to grow. Uh, without any further ado, I request Ms. Nidhi Katti to uh, introduce our inaugural speaker, Dr. Uh, Dr. T.S. Ravi Shankar, sir. Thank you, Manali. Thank you so much. It's a privilege to introduce uh, Dr. Ravi Shankar, sir. Ravi Shankar, sir, uh, born in the year 1955, uh, had his MA in Sanskrit, MA in Ancient History and Archaeology, and PhD from the University of Mysore. Having joined the epigraphy branch of the Archaeological Survey of India as an epigraphical assistant, he has served for more than 35 years in different positions and gradually has risen to the present position of head of the branch. He retired as the director of epigraphy. He is the chairman of Epigraphical Society of India, executive member of a place named Society for India, and vice president of South Indian Numistic Society. Dr. T.S. Ravi Shankar has established his expertise in the despairing Sanskrit inscriptions and also early coins. Presently, apart from editing of the annual reports of uh, Indian epigraphy, the departmental publications. He has worked as an expert numismatist from Archaeological Survey of India at Delhi Customs Office to examine the coins. From last more than 25 years, he has been teaching the students of postgraduate diploma in archaeology at the Institute of Archaeology, Archaeological Survey of India, New Delhi. He has coordinated and conducted many workshops on paleography, epigraphy, and numistics at Delhi and Mysore. He has also participated in many important archaeological excavations at different places, an important one being that at Ayodhya, and also participated in many seminars, conferences of national and international levels, and has contributed number of scholarly articles in English and Kannad languages to many reputed journals. Recently, he visited Baku, the capital of uh, Azerbaijani, for study of Nagari inscriptions available in that country under the Cultural Exchange Program of Government of India. Recently, he delivered lecture at Indira Gandhi National Open University, IGNO, and at IIT Kharagpur on epigraphy. Uh, he is also general president for Epigraphical Society of India, held at Dharwar 2016. Uh, prepared lessons for epigraphy for Karnataka State Open University for MA, Ancient History and Archaeology, and conducted um, refresher courses on epigraphy at uh, 
I N G I G N C A New Delhi 2017. Uh, he has also delivered many lectures uh, and prepared text on script and languages for E P G uh, Patishala H R D Ministry Initiative. So, sir is continuously supporting us, motivating the history enthusiasts from two years, and uh, we want his support uh, uh, in future too. Uh, and thank you so much, sir, for being part of the history enthusiasts and always uh, motivating me and Manali and supporting us uh, uh, in these two years. Uh, and it's a really a privilege to introduce you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Nidhi. Uh, indeed, sir is a very valuable member of the History Enthusiast family. And I want to remind all of our audience members that last year's Atihasa Saptaha, uh, sir had given the first lecture. Uh, today, he has arrived as the inaugural speaker to the lecture. And the first lecture will be delivered by Professor Mahesh Thakkar, sir. So we are really excited about this. Uh, I would now like to request uh, uh, Dr. Ravi Shankar, sir, to begin the inaugural address. Thank you. Manali, good evening all the viewers. Uh, today is a very jubilant moment for all of us. It is the curtain raiser for the Itihasa Saptaha talks. My hearty congratulations and best wishes to history enthusiast group, particularly to Manali Momia and Nidikati, whom, as they mentioned, you know, last two years we know them. And I have great admiration and appreciation for their committed and dedicated survey uh, they are carrying on. Uh, and they have arranged in the last one year or so, uh, wherever no convenient company, I, I have attended some of the talks. And uh, they have arranged various book sessions also in these uh, last two years on uh, talks on uh, early history, medieval and modern history too. I recollect fondly, as just uh, Manali mentioned, I delivered the first talk on the last year in Itihasa Saptaha. And uh, I mentioned earlier too, even now I wish to remark on the logo, you know, they have beautifully designed. What else can attract an epigraphist? They have used early Brahmi script to mention Itihasa. That is, you see, the presence of epigraphy is amply uh, uh, testified, you know, in this uh, regard, uh, the particular aspect that drew my attention was early Brahmi script used for Itihasa. In this context, I wish to remark some of the journals also, they are using uh, late Brahmi characters also to mention the name of the journals too. And the juggernaut of uh, history enthusiasts has traveled more than two years very successfully, right from the inception. I wish uh, successful uh, journey uh, further too. Many more members also should join to strengthen the group and motivate uh, Ms. Manali Momi and Nidikati to have many more such uh, uh, programs. Uh, the talks that's going to take place on the following days, you know, by various scholars, academicians on varied aspects of archaeology, museums, divinity, metallurgy, iconography, religious institution will be a great intellectual treat, feast, I should say, for all the uh, scholars. I admire host Manali Momaya and Nidikati contacting scholars across the country and arrange the talks. My inaugural talk is on epigraphical uh, studies and archaeological excavation. I thought, you know, I wish to connect two aspects. And uh, I was looking for a, a subject which uh, can be uh, delivered. As you all know, there is uh, a change in the perception, reviewing and understanding of epigraphical studies, archaeology, and many allied aspects. The multidisciplinary and multidimensional approach is gaining ground. Uh, in the recent years. I wish to state that the epigraphical studies is intended uh, to mean uh, not merely epigraphs. See, I have meant epigraphs when we speak in the context of excavation, 
perhaps many more written records come into the foray. So then I should take a little more, you know, uh, in the paleographical study, epigraphy pass, one of the segments will be study inscription. Uh, actually, you should have mentioned the paleographical aspects because other than the inscription, we have got large amount of other uh, written materials on uh, seals and sealing, coins and potsherds, many, many uh, materials uh, come to light. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, the main thrust of the talk is more than the epigraphical studies. I wish to say the emphasis on the calligraphy, the development of uh, various scripts uh, in the entire Indian uh, subcontinent. As you all know, most of the excavations have yielded some written material or other, maybe seals and ceilings, coins, some fragmentary stone slab, uh, pedestal inscription. Uh, brick inscription. Uh, here I wish to uh, recall, uh, record that uh, uh, Jagat Gram is a place uh, near Dehradun where they have found uh, Ashwamedha site, you know, many brick inscriptions were uh, located. So many more such uh, from Erich, many uh, such brick inscriptions have come to light, but I am highlighting uh, one or two. So the knowledge of calligraphy of various scripts is highly essential. Uh, see, those were the days in the Archaeological Survey of India also. They used to have, you know, those who have uh, studied instead of archaeology or diploma in epigraphy from various disciplines. Uh, for the in-service person, they used to have refresher course uh, on epigraphy and calligraphy. Maybe, you know, they would have studied 10 years or 15 years earlier, much earlier. So to uh, again connect them to the subject or uh, when they go again on the field to make an in-situ in study of the inscriptions or any written material, the knowledge of calligraphy is so essential. So we can't see in isolation the archaeology or epigraphical studies or uh, calligraphical uh, studies. So uh, the knowledge of uh, a script is highly essential student of archaeology to make an in-situ study of written objects to corroborate other archaeological objects or artifacts. Uh, here, I wish to mention here, uh, Richard Solomon in his book, Indian Epigraphy, he has brought to focus a very, very important aspect that is from a period which changes from 1901 to 1947. Richard Solomon observes, that part from regular epigraphical survey and copying of inscriptions in the period ranging from 1901 to 1947, many epigraphical materials came to light from the planned and systematic archaeological excavations. Inscription could thus be studied not only in and of themselves, but also in the chronological and archaeological context. In this sense, the turn of the 20th century may be said to be the mark of the beginning of the era of archaeological epigraphy. He uses a very catchy, very interesting phrase, archaeological epigraphy in India. Further, he states that this development reflects the influence of Sir John Marshall, who served as director general of the Archaeological Survey of India from 1902 to 1934 and transformed the survey from an agency essentially involved in antiquarian collection to one sponsoring orderly excavations carried out according to the scientific standards uh, prevailing at that point of time. Among the excavations undertaken under Marshall's direction, that yielded major epigraphic material uh, finds were at the, from Saranath, Nalanda, Bhita, and ba Basra. The results of such excavations were reported in detail in the new series of annual report, ASIAR, which commenced from 1902 and continued until 1937. In a much later phase, 
Several excavations were undertaken by central and state archaeological departments and uh, the uh, university archaeology departments also have yielded abundant epigraphical material. Uh, for instance, those from Shalihundam, Amaravati, Nagarjanakonda, Sanati, and many more sites. I can't manage. From the last many decades, regular and systematic excavations are being conducted. There may be not any state where archaeological excavation not being conducted. In this brief talk, inaugural talk, uh, it's very difficult to mention excavations that have taken care place or carried out by different states and uh, uh, in different states and the epigraphical material that has come to light. Among the major epigraphical discovery, at least in the North Indian context, most of the excavations, uh, when we look, you know, from North Indian context, even now, uh, recently, they have been doing both the Archaeological Survey of India and many state departments, they are doing periodically excavations. Especially in the North Indian context, we are bound to get a number of seals, number of seals and ceilings, uh, and of course, other materials too. So the if you just look, a large number of seals and ceilings have been reported from various uh, branches, you know, from excavation branch and uh, uh, Chhattisgarh State Archaeology last uh, few years back, they did conduct a number of uh, excavations. They have a huge uh, uh, collection uh, of uh, seals and ceilings belonging to different periods. And it's here, you know, the knowledge of calligraphy is extremely essential for an archaeologist. What I repeatedly say in different forums, the archaeologist should, while documenting, uh, even when we look at the Indian Archaeology Review, uh, there are a number of uh, seals and ceilings are reported, but not uh, at length given uh, more details. So if you access many uh, museums, uh, many uh, even central antiquity section of the ASI and many state archaeology department, perhaps they must have kept a huge collection of the seals and ceilings which uh, uh, recovered or which were excavated for some time. Uh, thanks to Professor Taplial, he brought out an excellent publication long, long back, and he has given the best, one of the deepest historical perspective, and he has studied uh, the cultural dimensions also of the uh, seals and ceilings. So here, what I would like to insist uh, upon, the, the basic study, all the archaeologists you know, in the field, right from assistant to many officers who are involved in the uh, collection or in the conduct of the excavation, uh, they should make an attempt uh, to study the seals and sealing and later uh, for clarification for further uh, this one, it can be sub sent to uh, the directorate epigraphy for the final uh, assessment or the decipherment of the seals and sealing. When we are talking about archaeological excavations and epigraphical material, uh, I need to mention about the seals that are reported from various Harappan sites. Uh, perhaps uh, Professor Mahesh Thakurzar in the course of his next talk, you know, would be uh, explaining something about the seals and ceilings from uh, the site. Uh, though it forms a separate uh, category by itself, uh, study, I am not going into the details of the decipherment and many aspects uh, that are connected with the uh, Harappan seal and ceilings. But uh, from the excavated site, when I am talking about the epigraphical study and the archaeological excavations, so necessarily the seal also forms seals and ceiling uh, that were covered, recovered from various uh, Indus sites uh, also form a major part of the study and uh, many are on the job of uh, decipherment. Many attempts are being made, uh, so which very well uh, fall, falls in the realm of uh, uh, proto-historic uh, 
uh, period. I know uh, how an archaeologist will be very uh, curious to uh, find some early epigraphs. Along with other archaeological material. Uh, <clears throat> so the thrill of finding an early epigraph. Uh, you too might have, you know, many of the archaeologists who are perhaps listening to the talk must have come across some early uh, dated or undated inscription belonging to early phase. Uh, that uh, thrill, you know, something different uh, in the course of excavation. Uh, which gives a perfect uh, chronological framework. Again, to reiterate the role of uh, palligraphy, uh, if you had examined some of the epigraphical material uh, recovered from various sites, you will come to know that most of the time is the inscribed, you know, the material that comes through, through the excavation site, uh, either they will be worn out damaged, fragmentary, and rarely we find a dated intact inscription. It's a rarity. So if you find a dated inscription in a stratified level, your joy knows no bounds to determine the antiquity of the site. But unfortunately, most of the time we find a fragmentary inscription where we would have lost the date portion. Most of the time it has happened when I have examined many, many such inscriptions. Unfortunately, uh, the, the date portion are lost. And they are reported. Those uh, material uh, are reported in different publications uh, in the context of some iconographical studies. I had to recently uh, consult a book by Yanart, uh, Inscriptions from Mathura. Uh, there, you know, number of inscriptions are there belonging to Jains and Buddhism and Brahminical, uh, all from different Kankali Tila, uh, various, uh, uh, various uh, archaeological sites from Mathura. I think it formed the earlier the nucleus from where, you know, it diffused to different parts whether you look in for some early Brahminical inscription, whether for any Jaina inscription or Buddhist, all you know we get uh, to, especially in the later period we have, even excavations also we have, especially for the earlier period, say from 3rd century BC to 3rd century Kamera, it's a very, very important phase to know about the religion, uh, many, many aspects connected and we have to necessarily look for the uh, early inscription. If uh, some Buddhist work is mentioned, if some Jaina uh, work is mentioned, or if some subsects are mentioned, it gives a clearly clear chronological framework because many literary sources are there. There are so many literatures in subsequent period. But uh, if it is mentioned, especially in the early epigraphs, so it has its own value in the historical uh, context. So uh, Mathura, Taxila, so many Nalanda, so many sites are there. It's very difficult to uh, mention one or leave other. And wherever such excavations have gone, you know, in the later phase, it has yielded number of uh, uh, inscriptions, especially uh, from Andhra Pradesh, the they are rich treasure house. When you say the Nagarjuna Rukunda, Amaravati, of course, at later phase, the Panigiri, uh, Buddhist sites, you know, they have yielded number of inscriptions, Satavana and successors, Ikshwaku uh, period inscriptions. They are of very high value and uh, they have been studied and documented, but again, uh, through excavation. These uh, very rich uh, inscriptions in Prakrit and Sanskrit, they have been reported. Uh, even for that matter, from Sanati, uh, I could not personally visit. I deputed some officials to copy all those inscriptions that were from some uh, Sanati excavations. Uh, we do have a large uh, 
a uh, number of inscriptions reported from the Sanati site also. So the uh, here comes the role of calligraphy. When it is an undated inscription, you are supposed to know when you see a ceiling or some inscription fragmentary seal, you immediately, as you will say, uh, this belongs to 3rd century BC or 1st century uh, BC. And uh, like that, you know, uh, if you have the knowledge of the script and its modifications uh, in subsequent period, you can ascribe that uh, seal or ceiling or inscription to Shatrapa, Kushan, uh, Gupta, later Gupta, like that. So uh, knowledge, plus or minus, I don't see, you can't give the absolute chronology. Dated inscription is the first. But in the absence of the dated inscription, uh, if you have the knowledge of calligraphy, you can fairly fix. And there are corroborative evidences. In the excavated site, you may find an image which uh, stylistically uh, belongs to that period also, 5th or 6th century. And the, the epigraphs also may be dated to that period and other artifacts. So it's we can correlate, go uh, study uh, other remains which uh, fairly well goes with the uh, uh, epigraphs of that period. So, uh, knowledge, why, you know, I chose, there is a great need. Uh, we have to again, again, draw the attention of these scholars to the area of epigraphy, which is not getting the due attention. So, uh, archaeologists, or maybe art historian, or any, uh, you know, a knowledge of basic knowledge of calligraphy, and uh, uh, epigraphy is absolutely ancient. When I was making a study of the iconographical studies, uh, a scholar remarked, we should have a person of uh, like C. Sivaramurthy, who was a great art historian. At the same time, he had a very great in-depth knowledge of the uh, scripts also. So he could, uh, such a person with in-depth knowledge of both, you know, it will be extremely useful for our uh, study. So again, you know, we have to uh, take up this. Uh, to uh, conclude uh, my talk, you know, I have to mention, so far I mentioned something. Uh, in this long 35 years of my uh, service, more than that, uh, I got uh, very few uh, chances to be personally uh, be present in the excavated site to examine. Uh, mostly by the time, you know, they would have been uh, stored in the museum or some places we have studied. But uh, I got, you know, uh, in the early part of the uh, eight, uh, 80s when I joined the department to visit Udaygiri. Uh, it's a great uh, Buddhist site and they had already carried out excavation. And uh, I had to uh, see beautiful images of Buddha, uh, seated Buddha in Bhumi, Sparsha Mudra and the various uh, Bodhisattva images. Of course, uh, with the very famous uh, Buddhist creed, running around the hollow of the image that copy but the stylistical aspect and the uh, script that is written it's very well coincides and uh, whatever seventh or eighth century or little later uh, we could decide it on based on the calligraphy uh, and subsequently also from Udaipur, Udaigiri and uh, many more inscriptions were sent to us to the directorate of epigraphy uh, to examine and it was done in many many seasons for many years it was carried out uh, and i wish to remark uh, remember here the great uh, book written by debila mitraji the uh, director general earlier director general uh, it's a magnum opus what she has written on the degree I think the power is gone. Yes, sir. I think there might be a, a Wi-Fi disconnectivity. 
load shedding problem or power is uh, actually uh, uh, yes sir the power is <clears throat> that can be a problem of power uh, power system yes sir it's actually raining over here in karnataka i think that okay. might be the issue okay uh, i will just uh, ask sir you can call him yes sir Uh, sir will be joining from his mobile. Uh, uh, he will conclude his uh, talk. There was some issue with the power. Okay, okay. Uh, Nidhi, until then, please, uh, yeah, let us uh, share the brochure of the entire event. Uh, we will just announce what are the lectures that will be uh, following today's lecture. Put it on full screen. Uh, so, as you all can see on your uh, screens, uh, we have seven lectures from seven eminent uh, uh, scholars from today to uh, 13th May. 13th May is the second anniversary of our page. Uh, today's lecture is by uh, Dr. M.G. Thakkar uh, on uh, Dhola Veera, a vestige of uh, uh, Sindhu Saraswati civilization. Uh, tomorrow's lecture will be given by Dr. H.M. Siddhan Gowder, sir, on museum organization. Uh, you, everyone has to definitely uh, join that also because it will be extremely um, uh, this, uh, enlightening. Uh, sir has joined us, sir. so I think we can uh, uh, complete the inaugural address. First. Yeah, I will just uh, uh, conclude within another two three minutes. Uh, yes. Sir. Uh, the next uh, site, you know, which uh, I visited was Hatab in Gujarat. Uh, it yielded a large number of uh, seals and sealing. I was in situ to examine them. Uh, it belonging to different uh, uh, time zones. So that was one where I stayed in the site and uh, could uh, decipher in situ. And the another very important uh, uh, site which I was there in when archaeological excavations were going on and uh, uh, Fatehpur Sikri, Agra Circle did, they did conduct uh, in uh, Birchpali Kachila. Uh, they did conduct excavation. Many beautiful images were brought to light, uh, including one standing image of uh, Saraswati, which had a beautiful inscription, uh, and many, many Jaina inscriptions, uh, uh, pedestal inscriptions, some uh, mutilated uh, sculptures were also found. So that's uh, a Jaina site uh, where we had large number of uh, Jaina images were uh, uh, reported. And another uh, one is the Ayodhya inscription, which uh, Ayodhya, where I participated. Uh, there also, uh, one thing I got, you know, though we didn't find any startling uh, epigraphs, you know, uh, about the uh, later when I was there, I had a great opportunity of working with the different branches of the ASI. Of course, the coins and ceilings and many other archaeological material uh, uh, came to light. Uh, and the in Karnataka, I participated. I, of course, it was uh, as a pilot uh, project. The Talagunda uh, site was excavated. And I did visit uh, because along with the many, there was a good tiding site, it seems. Uh, many uh, interesting uh, epigraphs also uh, came to light. Now, much debated, there is one early uh, inscription uh, they say according to the archaeological stratigraphy and other aspects it can be even dated to early year to halmidi there's a debate uh, between the different scholars uh, since i am not into that uh, calligraphical aspects of kannada inscription i have not given my uh, final word on that uh, but uh, scholars are examining them and along with that you know there are many other uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, inscriptions, copper plate inscriptions of Kalachuri, different periods were uh, available uh, in the site. 
So these are uh, half a dozen sites, you know, I could uh, visit during my uh, tenure and subsequent uh, period. So uh, with this, uh, I conclude my talk. I uh, have given a very sweeping, a broad uh, picture about the uh, archaeological epigraphical studies, of course, uh, the role of uh, paleographical studies and the archaeological uh, excavations in general. So again, again, I request the student to take up uh, the study of epigraphical studies. Uh, let them be uh, from go to different branches of archaeology, uh, but Epigraphy is a must to understand many aspects connected with that. So with these few words, I conclude my inaugural talk and I wish all the best to happen in the coming days. Uh, I thank uh, Ms. Manali Momoya and Nidhikati for giving me uh, an opportunity to interact with you all. So have a best day and uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, we are very inspired by your uh, work. Uh, it is uh, really an honor to know you personally, as well as uh, for you to be a part of our uh, history enthusiast family. Uh, thank you very much for the inaugural talk. Uh, it is now time for the uh, first lecture of the Itihasa Saptaha 2.0. And uh, I take this uh, opportunity and uh, feel immense pleasure to introduce the uh, lecturer of the first, uh, the resource person of the first lecture, Professor Mahesh Thakkar, sir. Dr. Mahesh Thakkar was born on 18th October 1968 in Gujarat. He completed his Bachelor of Science in Geology from Gujarat University, Ahmedabad, Master of Science in Geology, and his PhD in Neotectonics and Geology from Maharaja Sayajirao Gaikwad University of Baroda, Vadodara. Sir is a fellow of various professional bodies, including Association of Petroleum, Geologists, Geological Society of India, Mining Engineers Association of India, Indian Planetary Society, and Indian Society of Remote Sensing. He is also a professional. Uh, he also has a professional diploma in quaternary tectonics and paleo seismic studies. He is a life member of the Indian Society of Earthquake Science. He has served as a research assistant at the MS University of Baroda, a lecturer of geology and earth sciences, at, and later principal. Actually, R. R. Lalan College, Bhuj. He also worked. Uh, he was also the dean of faculty of science and in charge registrar at K. S. K. V. Kutch University. Besides being professor and chairperson of the university's department of earth and environmental science, uh, which he is presently serving as. Sir's PhD thesis is titled "Morphotectonic Evolution of Khari River Basin of Central Kutch Highland" under the mentorship of Professor L. S. Chamyal. He has also written a dissertation on granitoids of higher Kumaon Himalayas. Sir was awarded the best Raghu Amshi uh, Shodh Samshodak Award of 2013, which is an international recognition. Uh, Twelve scholars have been awarded PhD under his guidance, and nine others are pursuing research. Sir is also a member of the editorial board of reputed global journal of earth science and engineering, uh, Avanti Publishers, Pakistan. He is an expert on behalf of the GSDMA, uh, that is Gujarat government at uh, Smriti One Earthquake Museum, a dream project of the Honorable Prime Minister, and an expert and consultant of Meroform Noida and design factory at Smriti One Earthquake Museum, Bhuj. Sir has served uh, several minor and major research projects to his credit that have great scientific value. Uh, he worked as a project director on the uh, fossil restoration project uh, of the Gujarat tourism, uh, which was uh, which involved restoration of the main wood fossil park and other miscellaneous works near Dholavira, uh, Kutch. Uh, he was also project investigator in the fossil collection project for Dholavira Fossil Park Museum, a principal investigator in CSIR's research project on estimation of site response and seismic hazard in Kutch seismic zone and so on. He has delivered talks, lectures, and keynote addresses on various subjects at different national and international conferences and seminars. He has coordinated numerous workshops at national, national and international level, both in India and abroad. He is a visiting lecturer in mining geology at Government Polytechnic College, Butch, and Virayatan Engineering College, and so on. He has published two works. Uh, the first one in 2017, Geomorphological Field Guide on uh, Field Guidebook on Kutch Peninsula. 
and the other one a field excursion guide sedimentation tectonics and quaternary landforms of zanskar valley over 150 research papers abstracts and reports have been published in national and international uh, journals of great repute he has also contributed series of articles on earthquake its mechanisms and general awareness to the local daily kachh mitra sir has extensive field experience in geological mapping surveying and extensive trekking on the highly rugged terrains of kumaon sikkim garhwal uh, kashmir northeastern himalayas and the pre cambrian era uh, areas of gujarat and rajasthan uh, sir we are uh, really very uh, happy to have such a multi uh, faceted personality today with us uh, who has worked so extensively in the field of geology as well as uh, sir has a great regard for archaeology he is going to talk about dholavira which is a a uh, site very near to me myself as i am from kutch and uh, also as a student of history and archaeology because it is a great example of our uh, forefathers uh, um, uh, scientific and uh, uh, organizational expertise so we are really happy sir once again on behalf of myself and nidhi i welcome you to the page and uh, i now request professor mahesh thakkar sir to begin the lecture thank you <clears throat> thank you so much uh, manali uh, uh, i did not expect uh, this long uh, extended introductions it was it should be very brief introduction anyway uh, the journey would be very interesting definitely uh, before i start uh, uh, my lecture uh, or interactions uh, i should uh, express my gratitude to manali and nidhi and of course uh, uh, dr ravi shankar uh, because i am not the expert in archaeology anyway uh, i didn't know many things about archaeology and the epigraphy knowledge i knew something about it but i am not going to speak about any epigraphy or any of the uh, hardcore archaeology today uh, so i am also thankful to everybody those who are listening just now uh, and uh, the journey would be can i share my ppt uh, yes sir i am sharing it just a second ji you have the you have that ppt okay okay so, yes sir i have shared so i just stop sharing okay yes sir so so i'll have to say uh, next okay every time yes no issue yes sir okay so you will manage it anyway yes sir so this journey is not a very uh, uh, short journey of uh, 6000 years uh, from today but uh, i will get you to the uh, journey through the origin of the earth and till today so this is a 4.5 billion years old uh, history of the human being because to understand the uh, civilizations say around uh, uh, the uh, sindhu saraswati civilizations it is today we say sindhu saraswati but earlier it is known as even today it is known as harappan civilization it is also known as indus valley civilizations but since the geologist those who are working on the quaternary science i am also working on the quaternary science of last 2.6 million years of climate and tectonic history so those who are working on the climate and tectonics of last 2000 2.6 million years till last uh, 12000 years that means the holocene period they have found several clues of the saraswati vedic saraswati river which is a short lived river not actually originating from the higher himalaya so it doesn't it did not have the the good catchment of the glacier melt uh, water and that is why and there are other climatic factors of the disappearance of this uh, mighty river saraswati and even the migration of these rivers to the west uh to the to the indus and indus also migrated so this is a long story and now 
I I will try to make it short as short in one hour, one and a half hours. So my journey will start next. My journey will start uh, from the uh, Manali, please. Uh, my journey will start from the uh, millions and millions of years old history. I mean to say uh, the human came in quaternaries. As you say, see in these slides, uh, the right side last uh, quaternary is written where we have a small human. Okay, so human came in quaternary, but our roots are all along the 4 billion, 4.5 billion years old. We have a uh, early proterozoic or proto life. That means the first bacterial life, which was 2.7 billion years from today. And after that, in the proterozoic period, we have multicellular organisms. When we have a multi-tissue uh, organisms and all through journey, it's a very long journey how we got the free oxygen carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and then how we got this atmosphere, how we got the uh, conducive environment to develop the uh, animals and plants in water as well as on the land. So that particular things which leads us to at Cambrian period. So early Cambrian period, we have a shelled animals. That means we have a skeleton, exoskeleton, then inner skeleton animals. Then we have a fish period. That means the age of fish in the Ordovician and Devonian. After that, we have a land plants. We have uh, in the uh, Ordo, uh, Carboniferous period, angiosperms. Uh, started, then we have a uh, uh, reptile, age of reptile. So from Permian onwards, that means 300 million years onward, we have the age of the reptiles. So we have huge reptiles of the size of uh, more than 175 uh, meters, huge dinosaurs in Triassic, Jurassic and Cretaceous. It is known as the age of the reptiles. So large reptiles came into onto the earth and slowly and slowly we have a uh, winged insects then first birds then first flowering plants in the cretaceous period and after that cretaceous ends and we have a large mass extinction period between the boundary of the uh, cretaceous and the and the paleogene or tertiaries and then tertiaries that means paleogene and neogene period of last 65 million years of period that is the period we call the mammals, age of mammals. These mammals is mammals are in, in large numbers of varieties of the mammals are there. After that, at the end of the uh, paleo neogene period, there is a quaternary period. And that quaternary period uh, is known as the age of man. So whatever the journey, whatever the roots of the civilizations, today we have the Indus civilization, Mesopotamian civilization, uh, Egyptian civilization, Maya and other Chinese civilizations, their roots are here in the quaternaries. So next, uh, Manali, please. So in the uh, quaternary period, if you look at uh, the... Uh, the, the history of the quaternaries, that means 2.6 million. It is a, not a very small period. 26 lakh here is a 2.6 million. But in this particular period, we have the development of the uh, early humans. We call that early hominids. These early hominids, they, they actually evolved in Africa. And after that, they have moved to other parts. So this is the period of the 2 million years. After that, 1.9 million years ago, we have the on the earth, Homo erectus uh, came into the pictures. This Homo erectus has a larger brains and the short digestive systems. And they have the ability to move uh, long distance travels, walking and running. And, and, and that's why they, they moved to many parts of the 
continents to the north in the Europe and to the other parts of the Asia. <clears throat> so after that, the Homo Hindelbergensis is around 700,000 to 200,000 years ago. That first human, those who could adopt the colder climates and they started hunting the larger animals. And, and after that, uh, around 400,000 to uh, 40,000 years ago, we have, I mean, the humans have developed a very, very uh, good sophisticated technology to hunt the animals and to, to make the food, they make the houses, dwelling, uh, uh, different types of dwellings. So these, these mans are known as the Neanderthal mans. And after that, at the end, we have a Homo sapiens of around 200,000 to 10,000 BC. That means 12,000 BP. We have a uh, we we have uh, the Homo sapiens, which is a very very uh, near to the today's uh, human beings and perfectly matching the anatomically as a modern man. Next, Manali. Next. So we have to understand how they evolved through time. The Homo erectus has uh, earlier developed the uh, how to use the, uh, the 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 fire, how to use uh, different kinds of weapons. So they have started using fire for the protections for the even making the foods. So you can see some of the pictures where Homo erectus. This is the period of 1.5 million years to 800,000 years. So they they still were moving here and there. And they didn't have any proper permanent dwellings or settlements. But in the Neolithic periods, they have started making very, very good technology. As I said, they started making flint tools. That means earlier they want the tools. So based on the different types of the tools, we, we make the difference that is a Paleolithic period, Mesolithic period, Neolithic period. So this Neolithic period is one of the best period or one of the most promising period to understand the today's uh, uh, civilization, roots of the civilization. So next, Manali. So look at some of the very interesting tools, the journey of the tools from Paleolithic to the Microlithic to the Neolithic. Just you will see and you will uh, you understand uh, the technological development in the left side of the uh, slide. You will find the bigger tools. And uh, they used to throw those tools. And, 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 and this was not very convenient to hunt the uh, animals. So that's, uh, they started making us finer tools, very sharp and then they put it on the arrowhead. So they call the arrowhead tool. So you have in the right side, you have an arrowhead tool. So uh, the, this kind of technology they develop just to, just to have food and just to have a protections. After that, in the uh, micro uh, Neolithic period, you can see very, very sharp and very micro tools developments. I tell you, uh, this kind of tools are largely available in Kutch, but not a single paper, few, except one or two papers. Nobody is working on these microlithic, mesolith, uh, neolithic tools in Kutch, but there are more than 20 sites. When we do uh, quaternary studies, climatic study, we come across many of such sites, but generally we discard. But now I think we should do something with the uh, experts on the kind of uh, the tools. Next. Manali, next. With the tool, uh, after the tool technology, they actually adopted many such other, some other technologies that uh, because they used to move here and there, but wherever they got some resources, they used to stay for, for a time being. After that, the resources over, they go to some other places and they, 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 they flourish to other areas. But this kind of things uh, were not basically, uh, 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 sorry, the, this, kind of, this kind of movement 
were there during the um, uh, Homo erectus period and uh, Homo hindelbergensis period. But during the Homo uh, neanderthal uh, period, they have started settling at some places. The early dwellings uh, found in France, that is very, very old, 400,000 years old. But uh, uh, that is the only all over the world. But after that, 50,000 years ago, uh, there are the uh, uh, Neanderthal people. They started staying at some particular place for longer and all round period. And they started making the, the huts made of uh, wood, made of rocks. And it was a kind of still semi-permanent residence. But the earliest uh, year-round shelter uh, the, uh, is found uh, at Israel. And that is around 26,000 years only. So, so we can say the roots of our, yeah, yeah, you can go. The roots of our uh, civilizations, which we call the uh, 12,000 to 15,000, so before that, the human started uh, setting at some particular uh, resources, that means the river systems. And after that, if you see the Neolithic revolutions, the Neolithic revolutions, which is basically based on the their agricultural development, the domestications of the animals and plants. So that took place at around 12,000 years to 15,000 years. We have domesticated the uh, large number of animals which were moving here and there. We have taken horses, we have taken uh, the cows and many other goats and many other animals which today we, uh, they are very much mingled with us as a domesticated animals. After that, you know, there are, there are many plants which like a wheat, barley, there are uh, the paddies, these plants, uh, there is a long history. I'm not going to talk about the history of this migration of these plants from one place to the other, even from the civilization. But before this civilization start, this, this basically, uh, 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 the, the, this domestications was done at the Neolithic period. And it is, also, it is also known as the Neolithic revolutions. And after that, the full-time transitions from hunting gathering to the permanent communities. So they started settling at permanent uh, uh, settlements. So that is the period of around 12,000. And, and that is how we have uh, successively got different civilizations like in Mesopotamia, China, India. There are several other civilizations. They, they started individually, they grown individually. But of course, they have the roots of these hunter-gatherers. So hunter-gatherers, they were moving last 200,000 years and they settled at some particular place. And after that, there are several issues which we will discuss. Then uh, still, there are some, some uh, uh, tribes like Bushmen in South Africa and uh, Sentinelis in uh, Andaman Islands. If you have visited Andaman, you must see everybody this island, but it is not allowed to go. But the some of the other tribes which are still of the primitive, just like hunter-gatherers. But these are the only two to three tribes all over the world. They are, they are stopped uh, growing, they are stopped evolving, and they are still in the same positions which 15 to uh, 20,000 years from today. Next. So now we have uh, now understanding to know that uh, the uh, hunter-gatherers, they have settled at some particular place. They become agricultural loving people. They become the uh, uh, animal loving people. Uh, we call the domestications of animals and plants. So they are known as now pastoralists. And those pastoralist communities are scattered all over the Asia, all over the Europe, and they also traveled after 12,000 years. 
the pastoralist communities that travel uh, extensively throughout the Asia, like Yamyana uh, pastoralist, they one branch went to the Europe, that means the West. The other branch of Yamana uh, pastoralist spread to the uh, China that and 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 hinterland uh, uh, Asia, and the Anatolian pastoralist or Anatolian agriculturist is just seven thousand BC. That means nine thousand years from today, they they uh, shifted or they have traveled to the to Europe. Here in our uh, part, that means the uh, Middle East or Southern Asia, the Iranian agriculturists were very very strong all over uh, the world, and these Iranian agriculturists they spread to the Indus Delta regions. Then they spread to the northern part of the Indus that we call the Swat Valley. So these are the their roots next Manali. These are their routes to 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 travel to different parts and and earlier and after that they settled down and we have uh, roots of the civilization started and and these roots are the B M A C that means Bactria Margania archaeological complex. This is very important to understand the roots of our Indus civilization. This is also known as the Oxus civilizations uh, formed, uh, they developed around the Amudarya and Sirdarya uh, around 2400 BC. And of course, there is uh, Andronovo civilizations above these uh, uh, Sirdarya and Amudarya in the Middle East. There are branches went down the, to the south, the Swat, then Cemetery H, which is today's uh, Harappan civilizations, copper horde is also part of the Harappans and painted graver that is also the part of our entire uh, Sindhu Saraswati civilizations. So they grew in a small pockets, but later on, later on in the early Harappan phase, they all amalgamated and they have a large community based development, e, the, the uh, urban development to to the even rural developments next so with this uh, little bit of understanding i think we can understand how the the pastoral they uh, move to the asian steppes turkish and mongolian tribes they in mingle with the turkish and mongolian tribe then andronovo culture andronovo culture then ultimately we are interested in the uh, how how the Indus Valley civilizations or our Sindhu Saraswati civilization came into the pictures because the Indo-Iranian or Iranian pastoralists, they basically came and uh, captured the area and where we had the ancestral North Indians, ancestral uh, uh, Indus people, they mingle with it and this particular one branch of the Indo-Iranian, they came into the Hindu Kush and they become the Indo-Aryan. And ultimately we have the Indus civilizations where in the timeline, I think everybody can see in the timeline that Vedic period, which we are interested in or which before the Vedic period, that means the Indus Valley civilization is almost 3000 BC to uh, 115, uh, 1015, uh, 500 BCE, that means before Christ. In this timeline, I think everybody can see the Vedic period is 1500 BCE to 500 BCE. And out of that, the, uh, the exact Rig Veda, when it was written, Yajur Veda, Sam Veda, and Atharva Veda, the period is also, we have found out. The event of Mahabharata is also given here as a 1000 to 800 BCE. The, this was the apex written during this 3000 B, BP uh, around this, uh, this period. Next, Manali. And this is the picture of uh, the parallel, so several other civilizations developed uh, 
uh, I mean, simultaneous civilizations, which uh, with our Indus civilizations, there are uh, uh, very well known Mesopotamian civilizations around the Euphrates and Tigris and around the Nile River systems. There is a um, uh, Sumerian civilization or we call Egyptian civilizations. And here it's a comparative picture is given the the uh, between Egyptian, Mesopotamian, Chinese and Indus civilizations. This is all around 4000 BC. That means uh, 6000 from today. There is no exact period I have given here. Those who are studying in uh, in details, uh, the exact periods of uh, uh, the rise and fall of the early Harappan, late Harappan, mid uh, and mature Harappan is also, yeah, I am giving you the uh, overall uh, outline of the civilization because ultimately we have to come to the uh, Dholavira and the, it is basically the part of the Sindhu Saraswati civilization. Next, Manali. So this will picture, I think we it will give you the part of the mature Harappan civilizations where many of the part, most of the part of the Gujarat, which was covered during the mature civil, uh, Harappan civilizations. And, and, and uh, you can see uh, the major towns of uh, mature Harappan, Harappa, Gunwariwala, then, uh, then, then Rakhi Gadi, then uh, Mohenjo-Daro, then uh, uh, Kot Deji, Chanu Dero. There are many big cities which were found during uh, uh, in, in uh, mature Harappan phase. Out of them, the Dholavira, if you can see in the in Gujarat, northern part of the Kutch, which is very promising. And uh, this is the only biggest Harappan Valley civilization or Sindhu Saraswati civilization site in India. How, why and how that we will see next. You can see the uh, how the Indus Valley civilization site. Uh, I think I will skip this slide because uh, how the uh, late uh, our our British uh, government officers how they discovered this site. But some things are very interesting. So I think I should uh, uh, give you this particular picture that 18 Alexander Burness. In 1827, when he was traveling from Multan to Lahore with many horses to uh, as a gift to the king, okay, uh, Ranjit Singh. At that time, he discovered a small uh, artifacts, and 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 this particular site was identified in 1827. After that, Alexander Cunningham, uh, of then British officer of this particular area. He excavated first time in 1872, the uh, Harappa, Harappa site. After that, the history is very, very interesting. Uh, uh, they started making the uh, infrastructural development in India and Multan to Lahore, uh, then um, Lahore to Sindh and uh, Bikaner. There are railway lines. So these railway lines, when they excavating the work for the railway lines and they put the uh, bricks for the uh, railway tracks they found many quarries these quarries are basically the site of harappa mohenjo daro so they excavated this site but without knowing that archaeological importance and there are there are millions of bricks they have used to make the track uh, between Multan and Lahore. It is basically 150 kilometer long railway track made by the bricks uh, uh, found from the Mohenjo Daro. So you, you can uh, imagine how uh, massive the site, how massive the residential complex or citadel it would be that 150 kilometer long uh, railway track is totally made up of these bricks without knowing it. But after that, next, after that, uh, in the uh, uh, 1922, uh, 
this particular site was started i mean uh, came into the pictures because uh, because john marshall uh, then officer there he uh, he he deploy he deputed somebody uh, somebody is there written here uh, he deputed a very uh, uh, expert who worked in sumeria that means who worked in egyptian civilizations he he came here and they started working on uh, this site for the first time in 1914 but uh, the actual excavation started in 1924 uh, 23 and 24 by john marshall but at that time they found because before that this earlier uh, this earlier 10th 20th century before this earlier 20th century we did not the entire world did not know that there was a kind of civilization which is called indian or indus civilization or sindhu civilizations but after getting the uh, similarity of some of the uh, uh, some of the beads some of the seal which they found in mesopotamia so they come to know that there is a connection between mesopotamia and uh, uh, indus civilization so this is this could be a large civilization so they 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 took it very seriously and excavated the site next manali excavated the site uh, meticulously in 1924 after that 1944 there were several other uh, uh, excavations more uh, i think this is everybody from the archaeology uh, background they they know more mortimer willer because he wrote uh, extensive uh, books Uh, on particular harappa and uh, and uh, and mohenjo daro in 1944 he has excavated uh, extensively all the sites and after that several other workers came rai badu uh, they are ram sahani madhu swarup watts next so then uh, i think uh, uh, you, uh, with this little background Uh, we come to know about their connections through the seals and these harappan seals were found in the uh, mesopotamia ur and many other places so they had a very good connections how did they connect just 4500 to 5000 years from now they had a very good trade routes that we will see there are seals next there are seals there are many other uh, 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 busts, the bullock carts, and many other things which I am not going to mention over here. But these were uh, the 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 kind of terracotta, then kind of bronze uh, statues which are very famous. I think uh, in this uh, presentations, this uh, flipping is not possible because I think uh, Manali, this is not uh, PowerPoint, or uh, I think it is. Uh, pdf file i don't know but in my uh, powerpoint presentation uh, it is there the, these routes if you can see these routes uh, which they had a trade routes uh, to trade the 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 uh, kind of metals the trade the finished goods to trade or to bring the unfinished goods like uh, minerals so they had a very good uh, Uh, connections where they could get the uh, minerals in Rajasthan. From Rajasthan, they used to get the minerals, uh, the the base materials of the for the copper, lead, and zinc. The lapis lazuli uh, they used to work as a uh, use for the ornamentations. They used to um, uh, use for the beads and for the weighing weights. So these kind of the Uh, agates, uh, lapis lazuli, and some semi-precious stones they used to get from uh, from from Afghanistan, from Kirthar Hills, and there are many other uh, metals. But if you can notice here, my fellow uh, listeners, if you can notice, there is no iron here. It's Bronze Age. This is the Iron Age came after three thousand years. be for before present that means 1000 years b bc 
okay so in vedic period we have iron so iron age uh, they could they did not have the technology to smelt the iron they could smelt the uh, copper and other gold and silver these metals they could uh, process but iron was not actually in the pictures during that time next next manali oh so uh, so it, it is a uh, 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 there are several other slides i think we have missed it anyway uh, no, uh, i will just uh, share it once again uh, just give me one moment no, no issue no issue manali because as such uh, still i am half the way okay yes sir no issue okay doesn't matter yes yes sir so so now uh, the time comes that uh, we can talk about the the very significant part of the uh, indus valley civilization very significant part is basically the urban sanitization systems the urban sanitary engineering systems the all over the world the harappan people or we can say the indus valley people they have given uh, the world the toilets today's known toilets and running water uh, in the residential buildings uh, i think uh, whatever kind of the build, uh, sanitary uh, plumbers plumbing system pipeline systems which we have today okay this is basically uh, found or the discovered or first introduced by harappan people the mesopotamia or egyptian civilization they did not have such a uh, strong water uh, sanitation and even harvesting systems so the urbanizations in in indus is uh, is is i think ahead of all the civilizations Uh, of that particular uh, period so if you can see this uh, kind of the uh, the uh, uh, the pipes they used to use the clay or burnt clay pipe bricks they used to use the burnt clay pipes they they knew that if you burn the clay they becomes very hard and they can be used for the for the uh, drainage systems and such beautiful drainage systems is not only this is basically a picture of a uh, uh, harappa and mohenjo daro site but the similar things are available in dholavira also so next okay uh, i think uh, there is one uh, particular uh, map which is missing here manali Uh, because the behind this particular map there is one map of the of the kutch uh, entire kutch basin uh, uh, so i think uh, i we cannot see the entire kutch here anyway sir, uh, uh, i just need one second sir i will just share the other ppt just one second sir okay okay yes sir yeah i think yes yes that's true that's true so now my dear uh, listeners if you can see this is a kutch basin in geology we call it a basin basin is a small uh, place where the sediments come and deposit and it has a separate uh, geological formation separate geological elements like faults and uh, many other structural elements but here if you can see uh, very meticulously the kutch has uh, is divided into several segments but the the uplifted segments uh, which you can see the mainland the wagad then uh, pacham khadir bela and chorar these are the highland areas and which is called the rocky areas out of them uh, the khadir where i have made a small rectangle so this particular rectangle is around khadir islands why it is island because it is surrounded by the great run of kutch and this great run of kutch is basically 
uh, filled by the water during the monsoon period and for because it is not very uh, high from the mean sea level almost 1 meter from the mean sea level so so uh, several thousand maybe 20000 square kilometer area which was inundated uh, during the monsoon period and the these islands basically a rocky islands during the monsoon period they were surrounded by the water so today uh, they are totally disconnected with the mainland we have made the roads uh, but it was not connected with the uh, any land part so if you see walking through next uh, manali uh, manali next walking through this particular landscape to the into the great run of kutch is very very difficult you cannot walk because these are marshy lands there are quick sands and there are channels which is very uh, uh, i mean uh, you cannot walk so how did this dolavira is somewhere here if you can see dolavira is written here a small spot so the dolavira was a big big uh, uh, civilization spot and they have a very well uh, developed towns middle town upper town royals everything water harvesting systems so why did they develop over here when today you cannot walk through here you cannot have you cannot have any of the uh, uh, communication systems uh, any path so if you can see now the 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 uh, answer is with the geologist if you can see in the great run of kutch i think manali can make the uh, cursor move uh, uh, where there is a great run uh, written great run is written here okay where there are channels small paleo channels so these paleo channels we call it a paleo channel because this channel were existing in the past few thousand years ago and this channels used to use by the harappan people for the navigation for the movement of the goods or transportations so such kind of paleo channels are available all throughout the great run of kutch and even we have uh, we have we have intricate studies of the dating of those sediments when these sediments basically uh, uh, deposited here so that you can have the chronology of the sedimentation history and the even chronology of the uh, landscape evolutions so this is very interesting picture for uh, the archaeologists to understand how this culture has developed come to here and they transported everything over here next so this particular uh, landscape uh, here in a small uh, digital elevation model you will be able to understand how disconnected from all the sides the khadir island is this is a rocky island okay next but so dolavira is excavated in the late 80s 1985 uh, onwards uh, actually the first small uh, uh, pottery uh, found by the local people somewhere around 1975 and after that uh, dr rs bist i think everybody all uh, uh, archaeologists they know he is a famous this is a famous name for 25 years he worked in dolavira and he produced a very uh, extensive uh, uh, report of the of dolavira maybe 25 phd thesis also produced under uh, dr bist and we have a very uh, uh, um, but but i tell you only 20% of the site is only excavated still we have 80% of the site unexcavated so there are lot many work next lot many uh, works many uh, different uh, sites which we have to uh, excavate we have to work upon this is a very uh, i mean a google picture which will give you a very uh, uh, interesting point because this particular site where i have made the uh, uh, square or little bit of distorted square you can see a small 
uh, small mm, uh, tenements or some uh, structures the the middle part this structure is basically the upper town or we call it a, a citadel or where the royals used to live if, if you can notice here there are two rivers manhar and mansar so this entire dholavira site is basically made between these two rivers they are not rivers basically they are seasonal streams because there is no perennial uh, water today e and not even uh, 5000 years ago they didn't have very good perennial water source and that is reflected in their development next we will see that their development how do they develop the water harvesting systems here it is this becomes quite clear you can see a very good uh, uh, stream manhar and uh, uh, sorry manhar and mansar okay and now in the next picture next come on ali next okay in this picture i think you will be able to see the the main castle then you have middle town then you have lower town then we have irrigation and horticultural development so surrounding the middle town lower town and main castle we have several uh, reservoirs there are excavated 16 ex reservoirs 16 so uh, this site was actually um, uh, drought prone site there were frequent droughts and every drop of water which was falling on the khadir hills and they were flowing through the the there's water flowing through these two rivers during the monsoon they used to conserve a drop every single drop of water how did they conserve the water it is very interesting if you can see this this stream where there is a j j then there is a uh, can you see the j j written here there is a dam so 5000 years old they built a dam here damming the river the overflowing the water there they 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 channel this water to the main main uh, reservoir you can see the reservoir with 31 steps can you see the reservoir with 31 steps so the water used to store in this particular reservoir after that if this reservoir is full it will be oh, water will overflow and it will go to the next reservoir so one after the other they have the reservoir which were, they they used to use the middle town for middle town there were some other reservoirs for the <clears throat> lower town they have some other reservoirs and for the royals they have very good water harvesting system next manali <coughs> so this picture will give you the the uh, <coughs> main citadel this is the distant view of the main citadel next and this is that uh, reservoir uh, of 31 step the uh, uh, almost uh, 10 meter down the the huge water uh, reservoir they they used to store water all throughout the year they have they have made a geological study intricate geological study you will see in the next slide next manali yeah this is the wall of the uh, castle or wall of the citadel where uh, you can see a very uh, interesting construction of the wall they used to have a slope of almost 60 degree uh, so even any of these Uh, because they knew that this particular uh, area was prone to the earthquakes and they considering that they made such walls which even a 5 to 6 magnitude earthquake nothing will happen to such walls but even then some somewhere some walls are almost vertical they actually collapsed i think around uh, 1000 to 1200 bce earthquake 
we have dated or some other uh, researchers have dated these uh, earthquakes uh, from particularly Dholavira site. Next, Manali. Okay, uh, you can skip the. This is my uh, team of my PA, uh, uh, PG students, and uh, we visited the site. Next. Okay, here I think you can see uh, uh, the picture is taken from the. Um, the upper town and in the distant you can see a small circular structures so in the upper town actually actually the the uh, the, the in, at dholavira there are seven different stages of the civilization is found okay so the early in the early harappan period the stage is totally now buried so they used to make the town on the buried or the debris of the older older civilizations okay early harappan then in the mature harappan period they have they have used the bricks and rocks from a, all earlier people and they built the new town so there are seven seven uh, different stages or rise and fall of the particular town is found at particular this site so next in the next picture, you can see the, this in the late Harappan people, they used to make the rounded structures. This is very interesting. The early Harappan, mature Harappan people, they used to make the square uh, uh, shaped uh, residential complex or, uh, or, or uh, shops or any other structures. But in the late Harappan, because this is the structure which can withstand the earthquake. And they found the, the, the kind of physics uh, in such structures. And the, all early, later, later constructions are basically kind of bunga or kind of the circular structures. Next. This particular picture is, uh, I think, uh, uh, if anybody has visited this site, this 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 particular uh, site is uh, where the uh, the world's first uh, signboard is preserved here. So Dolavira people they had a big signboard. I'll show you that signboard here. It's still the 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 uh, script is uh, not deciphered. Next. This is where the uh, the signboard used to uh, put in particularly at this particular wall. You, you can see this straight wall is slightly tilted. So many, many geologists and uh, quaternary geologists, they said that because of the earthquake, this has collapsed uh, during some time. And that some time is around uh, 2500 uh, BP, uh, sorry, BC. Next. This is that uh, uh, script on the signboard. I think uh, um, uh, this particular signboard, uh, either it is stored over here, I have never seen it inside, but it's a replica is there in the National Museum in uh, uh, New Delhi. Next. Another uh, picture where uh, uh, you can understand the, uh, the reservoir systems why do they make such reservoirs? If the water is totally empty in this reservoir, uh, you can see a small well. So people can go there and they they explore exploit the water because anything which is left is it is in the uh, well only. So up to up to that level, they have the technology to use the single drop of water. But the beautiful thing here is uh, the rock cut reservoir. Next, we'll see the rock cut reservoir in the next slide. <clears throat> okay, uh, this is basically a rainwater harvesting structures. If you can see uh, the linings made here on the floor or on the uh, walls, it is clay linings so that uh, in the uh, summer, 
it will become a cool and the water will not seepage down so this is uh, fantastic rainwater harvesting structures the openings uh, if you can see here both the sides these openings is basically the rainwater which comes to this uh, the the uh, uh, small uh, tank like structures but this tank like structures they used to use for the bathing next i have written sm uh, some kannada language if it is okay with my kannada listeners and uh, uh, it would be okay i don't know anything about any any of the letter or uh, in kannada but i tried my level best to show them uh, in their language so this is a royal bathing place with the steps okay which used to get the water from the spilled over remains from the well while pulling through the bucket, uh, bullocks and rope tied with the leather bag so this is wonderful structures they had a 20 meter deep well and they have a pulley arrangements and the pulley has to be tied uh, it 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 was tied with the rope and rope was tied with the bullock bullock used to move and the water in the in the leather bag used to come and this water basically had a had a kind of a, a structure which comes to particularly this uh, small tank where royal used to bath so rani maharani or maharaja they used to bath over here actually there could be a upper uh, ceiling and everything it is all everything is gone but we can see their their structures next manali this is that well at, at least uh, uh, actually uh, uh, the the uh, uh, archaeology lovers they should come to uh, kutch and see uh, in person the entire dholavira site with little bit of understanding and little bit of reading of this particular site this is 20 meter deep well and very interesting part of this well is the rocket reservoir which we had entire uh, uh, middle town uh, surrounding the middle town surrounding the lower town all these rocket reservoirs when water comes to this reservoir they used to recharge the ground water in entire area so recharging the ground water this well will be recharged and this well when it is recharged all royals all royals on the uh, castle they used to use this particular water and it was a very very good sweet water they used to have next next manali okay this uh, you go go because uh, sorry uh, this rock cut this is a different reservoir so when i talked about the reservoir i think you can see the rock cut they have used the rock uh, uh, sandstone rock in such a way that they knew that uh, uh, the the quality of per, uh, percolation value of each and every rock and using that sense using the fault uh, geological fault Uh, they basically cut the reservoir and, uh, and 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 recharge the ground water and the beauty of this site is even today there is a rain i have seen during the rain even today if you go during the rainy season the entire system works after 5000 years entire system works beautifully how did they worked uh, 5000 years ago today also it works the reservoir filled up and the, there are there are uh, next next there is a the, you can see a small openings this is the canal opening from one reservoir to the other so if the the levels will be different each and every reservoir level will be di different and they have the they have the mechanism to to close the canal so this is very interesting some of the reservoirs you have you can see the ramp you can see the ramp in this reservoir so this ramp used to use for the uh, for the cattle to go there even for the maintenance of this reservoir to to uh, desiltations to of this reservoir so this is a fantastic structures next for 
the geologists also hydrogeologists also they have used the geological fault which generally is very problematic when you have a geological fault but they have used this fault to the lower reservoirs where the water will be seepage and they will be uh, the water will be recharged ground water will be recharged so how fantastically how scientifically they made each and every reservoir even uh, before 4500 to 5000 years ago next money next next these are the water harvesting structures on the surface these are some of the pictures where it is an entrance and vestige of the uh, the gate you can see the carving of the uh, some stones where they used to have the the hinges and the uh, big gates next you can see a very intricate carving and such carving was possible so they had a very good technology and we have also found some some sites in kutch and near to dholavira where they had a industrial sites they used to uh, smelt the uh, the kind of metal like uh, uh, copper next uh, as a geologist uh, we have dated some of the deposits uh, surrounding the dholavira region which is the fringe of the run and the mainland of the khadir so these these uh, are dated as 5000 on the uh, lower side to 4000 and the top is uh, around 500 uh, years ago so if you if you remove these entire deposits you are very close you are, you are very close to the uh, to the dholavira that means during dholavira period during this uh, 5000 years ago the particular particular dholavira site which is far from the i mean almost 6 to 7 kilometers from the fringe of the khadir island it was very close and almost the uh, it is close to the run today's run but run was not the run run today the great run of kutch the salty encrustation which was not the salty encrustation that time it was the kind of the uh, creek or the estuarine area where the small country crafts or the boats could be uh, driven through the uh, the the channels and i think you have seen the channels all uh, to the north to the to the dolavira and the channels we found from dolavira to even kori creek that means the almost uh, 150 kilometers uh, across the run to the to the to the uh, indus uh, uh, indus uh, uh, estuarine area today in the estuarine area next so how the question is how did they actually shifted the monsoon shifted east to ganga ganga plain monsoon shifted to the ganga plain and the people actually started moving and they slowly and slowly migrated so many indus people followed the monsoon and migrated to the ganga plain around 1500 bc that means 2 3500 years from now so sometimes the indo iranian came and ruled the rural communities and the great vedic period people with the most advanced civilization formed at particular this 1500 bc and the very very interesting uh, urban civilizations of indus valley they turned to the rural civilization again so this is very uh, very interesting and we uh, as a uh, quaternary geologist are working on particular uh, such issues next manali this is because of the holocene climate change holocene is 12000 years but when we are talking about the decline of harappan we can talk about the uh, last 2 uh, 3000 to 4000 years but how actually they they flourished they flourished because of the good uh, humid humid period so you can see increase in 
kind of vegetations, mesophytic vegetations between 5,000 to 3,500. That indicates moist period of Holocene. And after that, during the early Holocene, before that, sorry, during the early Holocene, uh, the Asia Asian may have almost two to four degrees warmer than the present. And that was the flourishing period of the Harappan. And that's why they had a very good rainfall. And that's why they survived there. But now, after uh, almost uh, uh, last 4,200 years, we have a dry phase. Next. So next, uh, okay. Uh, so the recent studies, they found that abrupt climate change around 4,200 uh, years from today or 2200 BC, that today now we call it a Meghalayan age. Scientifically, it is known as Meghalayan age. That is responsible because it is a dry phase. It is responsible for the collapse of the Harappan civilizations. There are scientific uh, uh, findings of the oxygen isotope studies, uh, which today we don't know to go into the details. But Cultural centers such as large cities of Mohenjo-daro and then Harappa, uh, Kalibangan, they completely abandoned during this phase. And the Saraswati also, Saraswati, Vedic Saraswati also uh, totally become dry and almost vanished under the great run of Kutch and the great Thar Desert. Next. Next, Manali. So this is the end note. I will just narrate you that the great irrigation systems. This is the uh, highlights of the entire talk and the Harappan civilizations. That irrigation system and uh, the great irrigation system and the related structures. Dolavira is considered as the most advanced urban site of that time. Just similar or parallel to the Harappa, Mohenjo-daro. Uh, Kot DG, Banwariwala, uh, and Kalibangan. A well-planned sewage system indicates higher engineering skill. And they were industrial people and navigating in the ocean much smartly than any other of this contemporary age. That means any other of the other civilization of uh, Mesopotamia, Chinese civilization, as well as the Egyptian civilizations. So this uh, this skill needs the climatic adversity. Hence, it is said that climate was not much congruent in the northern Kutch or western India so that they did not miss a single drop of water. This kind of climate was there in, 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 uh, in even in, during the uh, uh, in civilization. Kutch was not having good climate even that time. And th that's why uh, the Dolavira has uh, uh, developed very, very smart uh, uh, irrigation systems. So there are many theories of collapse of this great civilization, including the regional climate, global climate, powerful Aryan people captures. They have captured and they have gone. De-urbanization, slow but effective uh, tectonics. So as a uh, geologist and earthquake geologist, I would say the slow earthquakes and slow uh, upliftment and subsidence is the part and parcel of this entire landscape. And this could be one of the reasons for one of the reasons to decline of this Harappan civilization. Next. Okay, this is the end. Thank you very much, uh, Manali, Nidhi and uh, Dr. Ravi Shankar, listening me, everybody, all uh, listeners, they listened patiently uh, the intricate geological uh, perspective of the <laughs> Arapan civilization. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, indeed, it was very enlightening and uh, very informative lecture. Uh, because as students of history and archaeology, uh, for so long, we have studied it from one perspective. Uh, we have studied Indus Valley civilization, but we have only had one perspective, 
uh, we were only talking about the people and about uh, uh, what time they lived in but uh, as a student of history we also know and we have also been taught that geography plays a very important role uh, in the history of any particular community or region and uh, today we have understood uh, what kind of climate what kind of geological uh, uh, topography and uh, what kind of uh, 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 you know resources natural resources those people had and uh, how that affected uh, the scientific inventions which they have made uh, as they say necessity is the mother of inventions and uh, that is very much evident in the context of dholavira because the people have as you uh, showed us sir, uh, the reservoirs which they have built uh, even today we do not have such advanced and scientific reservoirs i think uh, yeah they have it, created i i know even even uh, the kind of uh, uh, sanitary systems uh, the drainage systems and uh, kind of reserve uh, water harvesting systems they were using today the half of the world do not have such systems half of the world populations if you say 8 billion people 4 billion people are devoid of this systems they are in a very primitive system so it's uh, very it interesting is... subject to discuss uh, personally with the experts i am not the expert in uh, archaeology i am basically giving the inputs because there are several controversies i know aryan invasion non invasion aryan captured this it's a very big in controversy i don't know much about the controversy there are political controversy also but uh, as a geologist as a quaternary geologist i think uh, uh, we are focusing more on the uh, tectonics and climatic aspects which basically a very very uh, great reason for the decline or the rise of such civilization uh, sir i had one question uh, yeah. so the dholavira is it on the uh, it is it near the convergence of two tectonic plates or is it far away from there so is it within the earthquake zone no yeah, uh, tectonic tectonic plates uh, the plate boundaries are very far from kutch almost 500 kilometers from kutch basically tectonic boundary that means the indian plate and the and the uh, eurasian plate the boundary is in in a suleiman range if you know in pakistan and uh, yes. chaman uh, chaman fracture zone and uh, in the in uh, arabian sea so the boundary is very far but as your uh, curiosity regarding the seismic activities in kutch uh, frequent seismic activity in kutch so i would uh, focus upon the fault systems kutch dholavira is very near to the uh, one of the major faults in kutch there are four major uh, tectonic faults which are basically responsible for many earthquakes in last 2000 to 5000 years or even last 200 years there was a big earthquake and even 20 years back there was a big earthquake in 2001 so uh, so so it is very near to the major fault which is called island belt fault uh, yes sir so it is interesting to note that even after 5000 years and after having gone through so many earthquakes the structures of dholavira are still uh, very much absolutely. intact absolutely so it's very interesting there are lot many things uh, even today after 2001 earthquake uh, the many ngos many uh, uh, engineers they worked on the kind of bunga structures that is rounded hut structures which is uh, which is mostly a characteristics of banni area banni plain banni region which is a grassland used to be grassland now there is no grass <laughs> left in uh, that banni area but they used to have the bunga structures rounded hut structures these not a single bunga not a single uh, circular hut was uh, collapsed during 2001 earthquake but most of the buildings the collapse even a Uh, uh, square shaped uh, uh, huts they collapsed but bunga did not collapse so now the other new structures they have adopted that particular technology they used to have few hundred years or few thousand years back 
yes sir in archaeology uh, we talk about something called uh, uh, conservation of uh, monuments uh, the, the, there's a law of conservation of monuments in which it says that if the base of the structure is wider than the top uh, so if it is in a pyramid shape or a semisphere um, then i think it has a, a more longevity than the other structures which have uh, Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. steep edges yes sir so i think that might have played a great uh, role in that particular Uh, conservation yes yes absolutely uh, yes if any of the uh, audience members have any questions uh, or uh, nidhi uh, sir uh, if you have any questions you can please uh, we can have some discussion for 5 minutes i suppose sir i actually have a curiosity uh, uh, so how did they uh, knew about all this technology sir uh, who taught them these technologies are there any mentions or can uh, are there any researchers on those which uh, kind of technology you are talking uh, about sir like construction uh, constructing uh, scientifically uh, these uh, water reservoirs and all those things how they learned about uh, those methods who taught them or was there any particular book about the necessity, uh, necessity is the mother of invention this is a universal uh, uh, saying and as you uh, you have the necessity and you have the uh, the best uh, out of the uh, options available so and they have the very good brains how to conserve the water so they started doing because the uh, from the nature we we get everything so when they have seen the river which is passing uh, uh, through it and which goes to the lower elevations they have put the dam so from that point they started making the dams he if i put a dam here if i put a obstacle here i can preserve reserve, uh, preserve the water okay then they have seen the property of the sandstone so this is a continuous process learning is a continuous process and that is what i i had given you uh, the 2.6 sorry uh, uh, 400000 to 20000 years of the our journey that's why i had given the journey because there are archaeologists working on the uh, the brains how our brain worked through the time how our neurons they are work, they are working on neurons how our neurons get danced uh, network so slowly and slowly with the time with the experience with the uh, struggle with the hardships okay every new experience we put inside our uh, neurons and that gives the uh, suggestions uh, to the to the brain and that will change our dna systems so that is how we evolve people are working on it if you can search how do they work on the brain development so brain developed so uh it's not one day job 100 years job i told you it is a uh, uh acts of years of job so when a human came uh, in in quaternary period that means 2.6 million years 26 lakh year so journey started from when we started hum ye yahan se uth gaye do pair humne haath humne utha liya hum do pair pe chalne lage tab se मिरेकल शुरू हुआ है तो दैट जर्नी वी शुड अंडरस्टैंड सो इट्स लॉन्ग लॉन्ग डिस्कशन वी कैन यू कैन कम डाउन टू कच एंड वील डेफिनेटली हैव अ गुड गुड डिस्कशन मेक अ गुड बिग ग्रुप इन विंटर सीजन एवरीबडी कैन कम एंड वील हैव अ ग्रेट डिस्कशन इन 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 द डिपार्टमेंट इन दट द साइट इट सेल्फ थैंक यू Yes, sir. Sure, sure, sure definitely, sir. Uh, we are now so intrigued. We really want to visit Dhola Vira and uh, several other sites which you mentioned because uh, uh, we have always studied it only from a historical perspective, uh, the date, the people. But uh, looking at it in the photos, in the pictures that you showed us, uh, it is really a marvel, uh, which has uh, continued to survive for so long. and uh, the makers of the civilization were really genius uh, so yeah. as you said sir uh, the cerebral developments that took place over the period of time mm-hmm. through evolution 
uh, and uh, uh, they might have influence from other civilizations uh, or not maybe they have influenced other civilizations yeah, but there are really there are many there are many evidences you you can see in the in dolavira also we had a yes, seal our seals were there their seals were here we have recently found some some uh, pottries which are uh, very common in uh, in uh, china so, okay so we have found the connection of the chinese people uh, around 20, uh, 3200 years we have got the sediments okay so we are doing all on the sediments and sediments gives us the date carbon dates or uh, optically stimulated luminescent dates so this will give us the time uh, sir i have one more uh, question actually uh, the people of uh, dolavira uh, so are there any uh, human fossils found and if so uh, where are they found? in what area of dolavira are they found <laughs> in dolavira only one skull has been found i think only one skull and few few bones that's all uh, nothing more than that i think that is uh, preserved in uh, uh, new delhi and i think maybe ravi shankar dr ravi shankar might be aware about it uh, if you have a connection with uh, dr rs bist he will focus more on it but but because so this is this is the very important they migrated slowly there was not a kind of big hazard or devastations all of a sudden just like a volcano just a flood okay or or because the drought conditions the uh, kind of climate change that is a slow process okay so they you they 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 used to migrate from one place to the other so they have migrated slowly to other place so these are big evidences yes sir uh, thank you very much sir uh dr ravi shankar sir if you have anything to add sir you are on mute uh nothing i have been listening all through uh <laughs> what archaeology have said at uh, my post graduation level then through and through being a core epigraphist uh, i did understand some of the concept but he has taken us in a long journey you know right from the origin and so many very very interesting and with the two with a lot of uh, pictorial uh, representation it was a wonderful lecture uh, how nothing to but i was just listening through and through uh, it was a wonderful talk indeed uh, very sir good i have one question i have one question there are some uh, uh, i think kalyan nathan somebody who has deciphered the harappan script uh, harappan scripts are now uh, people are deciphering the script i don't know much about it but if you get some uh, interesting books or some uh, write ups or some research papers on the uh, the the uh, unfolding the script harappan script so yeah. then we come to know so much of things about it because it's very difficult people have not it is not related to our brahmi lipi or some the present day other scripts yes no as you rightly said you know many are working scholars uh but unanimously you know it has not been accepted but uh, worth you know uh, even we have one society epigraphical society of india there were the days some 10 year 15 years before we had one full session on the indus uh, script itself there were many scholars uh, who used to contribute very uh, learned papers but unfortunately you know we over the period of time you know the real epigraphists are not uh, uh, so that's why i keep insisting uh, some younger generation you know, like minded people should come together like iit bombay so many iitians also they are showing lot of interest in this i hope you know some day if continuous efforts are made uh, we can uh, bring out uh, in case i get any such material sir i will uh, keep you posted sure, sure, uh, sir sure. uh, thank you thank you, thank you sir thank you thank you thank you very much sir
uh, if there will be any more uh, questions in the comment section we will uh, convey the same to the resource person and get the answers yes. later on uh, so uh, it was a really wonderful two hours uh, we did not uh, realize how time flew uh, the uh, inaugural lecture first and uh, then the very informative uh, uh, lecture by professor uh, mahesh kar sir uh, it was really a wonderful evening today we have spent uh, two hours very um, uh, uh, we can say uh, productively and uh, i'm very happy for that so the day one of uh, itihasa saptaha 2.0 has been a uh, wonderful success and we have come to the end of it so i now request ms nidhi katti to propose a vote of thanks first of all it was really a very wonderful lecture sir uh, thank you so much for accepting our invitation and uh, uh, giving this lecture on the history enthusiast uh, uh, group thank you so much uh, i also thank dr t s ravi shankar sir uh, you always been an inspiration support for us sir and uh, please continue your support uh, there is a lot more to learn from you uh for both of us me and manali and uh, thank you so much and i also thank all the audience who uh, supported us and who are supporting us and uh, thank you for being active throughout the lecture and uh, join us for tomorrow's lecture too and uh, uh, i also thank co-founder and co-host of uh, uh, this session ms manali momaya thank you so much you are really a wonderful partner for me without you uh, this group or this uh, itihasa saptaha was not possible thank you so much and uh, thank you to nadi uh, for being such a wonderful friend and co-founder and co-host uh, so tomorrow's lecture will be by dr h m sidan gowder sir uh, it is on a very interesting and a useful topic of museum organization uh since we are all living in an age where everything is virtual uh, there are some things that we have to go personally and enjoy uh, museums are one such thing even though today there are virtual museums i think uh, uh it has a great deal of uh, effort uh, it is a great deal of effort to organize museums to uh, take care of all the artifacts which are uh, kept there and uh, to have it in a coherent manner so tomorrow we will learn a lot about museums and how they can be organized from dr h m sidan gowder sir i request all our viewers to join us tomorrow at 4 pm uh, please note the time uh, today's lecture was 7 pm all the other lectures will be at 7 pm itself but uh, tomorrow's lecture will be at 4 pm uh, and it is sunday so everybody uh, will have some free time uh, definitely join us uh, thank you we are signing off uh, yeah. have a nice day good night bye bye congratulations to both of you manali and nidhi Thank you, you very much. You, you youngsters you, are really rocking, rocking, and the the fate of the archaeology is uh, in the hands of you uh, youngsters. So you. I congratulate you. I give my blessings to you. Anywhere, if you need any help, we are here. Okay. Good. Good night. Good night. Thank Definitely you, sir. Thank you so much. Without the help of elders, uh, we cannot do anything. uh it is on us the responsibility is on us we are sharing that with you but uh, your guidance and your support and your blessings means the world to us and uh, we are doing the bare minimum that we can as students of history and archaeology uh but uh, in future we will try to do more definitely uh so that is our promise to you uh we will keep doing what we are doing thank you so much thank you sir thank you so much thank you sir so we are signing okay. off yes sir thank you so much bye sir